Good morning. Welcome to this webinar on advancing agricultural herbicides through chemistry. My name is Jessica Wolfman, and I'm a research associate with the Chemical Sciences Roundtable at the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine. The Chemical Sciences Roundtable provides a neutral forum to advance the understanding of issues important to the chemical sciences and engineering and promotes the exchange of information among government, industry, and academic sectors. This year, we are continuing our series of webinars on pressing topics affecting the chemical sciences. This webinar series is entering its third year, and all of the presentations and recordings from 2020 and 2021 are available on the CSR website. If we can go to the next slide. Thank you. Today, we will discuss the nature and magnitude of herbicide resistance and explore opportunities through chemistry and needs to better control weeds in agriculture. The format will consist of three presentations followed by a question and answer discussion session with the virtual audience. Note that there will be, that there will be time for one or two clarification questions following each presentation, but all other questions will be addressed in the discussion time after the presentations. Dr. Mark Jones will be our moderator for this webinar. Dr. Jones is a member of the Chemical Sciences Roundtable and is a retired industrial chemist who now works as an independent consultant. He will be asking all questions on behalf of the audience. Questions can be submitted through the Q&A button on Zoom, which is located on the bottom control panel of your screen. The chat feature has been disabled on Zoom for audience members, so please use the Q&A feature to submit your feedback. And with that, I would like to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Mithila Jogulam. Dr. Jogulam is a professor of weed physiology in the Department of Agronomy at Kansas State University. Her work is recognized for increasing our understanding of the evolution and fundamental mechanisms of herbicide resistance in weeds. Her research also focuses on the effect of climate change factors on herbicide efficacy, as well as weed management and identification of herbicide resistant traits in crops. And with that, I will turn it over to you, Dr. Jugalam. All right. Um, thank you, Jessica, for the kind introduction. Greetings, everyone. Um, first, I would like to thank National Academies for giving me the opportunity to speak on this important topic, evolution of herbicide resistance in wheat. I'm really excited about the opportunity. I also would like to thank all those folks that are joining or participating in this webinar. Here is an outline of my presentation. I'm going to give an overview on global food production needs and also touch base on crop production constraints specifically related to wheat issues and give me overview on herbicide resistant crops and how introduction of this technology helped the way growers manage the wheat and spend a little bit more time on evolution of herbicide resistance in wheat and some mechanisms of resistance uh, that confer herbicide resistance and glands at glyphosate or Roundup most commonly known as uh, Roundup resistance in crops as well as wheat, and also uh, touch base on some of the management strategies that we can use for herbicide resistance, um, resistant wheat control. Finally, wrap up with um, summary and conclusions. So the global population is projected to be at uh, 9 billion by 2050. So there is uh, tremendous pressure on our farmers uh, to increase food production by 60% to feed the increasing population. Since 1950s, scientists have been helping growers to meet the food production needs. However, we must work even more diligently than ever before and uh, introduce technology so that we can feed the growing population um, across the globe. However, the farmers are facing a number of uh, crop production constraints. Among those, infestation with the pests, crop pests can, can be a significant one. 
crop yield losses because of infestation of these pests could be tremendous, especially as you can see from this chart, weed infestations can cause significant yield losses. However, chemical weed control or use of herbicides to manage the weeds has been extremely successful ever since herbicides were released for commercial use after the Second World War. Several different chemistries have been developed by industry and released for uh, weed control. Additionally, um, upon development and commercialization of herbicide resistant crops, the way the weeds were managed has changed significantly in growers' fields. So the fields started to look more like this, weed free upon adoption to herbicide resistant crop technology. This was almost like a silver bullet for growers. However, that didn't last long because of use of herbicides as a sole means of weed control strategy and also rapid and uh, immediate or extensive adoption to herbicide resistant crop technology resulted in evolution of herbicide resistance in wheat. So you can see the field started to look more like this, infested with weeds in some parts of the Midwestern US and also in other countries as well. So the evolution of herbicide resistance in weeds is one of the major constraints that growers are facing currently. So what is herbicide resistance? You may come across def different definitions for herbicide resistance, but I'm using one that was suggested by Dr. Pat Tranel at University of Illinois, which suggests it's a loss of effectiveness of a herbicide on wheat population. Again, herbicide resistance is a naturally occurring phenomenon and herbicide resistance evolves due to selection, meaning if we use same herbicide chemistry or same site of action of herbicide, over and over again, you will see the evolution of resistance in wheat. As it's shown in this cartoon, the plants shown here in black or resistant plants that are generally present in any wheat population. But because of selection, the number of resistant individuals increase in the population over a period of time, eventually getting dominated in the population. This is when it becomes really challenging for controlling these weeds. So then how do these weeds evolve resistance? What are the mechanisms that confer herbicide resistance in weeds? So the mechanisms can be grouped into two types. One is target site resistance. Here, the herbicide target, Again, each herbicide has a specific target, which could be a protein in the plant. So any alterations to herbicide target can make that plant insensitive to herbicide. So this can be possible because of mutations in the gene that is coding for the herbicide target. Thereby, there will be modification in the herbicide uh, target protein, resulting in inability of the herbicide to work in the plant. Also, it could be because of um, amplification or duplication of herbicide target gene, resulting in increased gene expression, thereby enough herbicide protein is available for the plant to function normally. The second mechanism is non-target site resistance. In this mechanism, herbicide target is still sensitive to herbicides, but other mechanisms such as reduced herbicide absorption or translocation, or in many cases, because of herbicide metabolism or degradation of herbicide. In other words, the herbicide becomes inactive due to activity of certain enzymes in the plant, thereby the plant can survive herbicide application. It's also important to remember if weeds have target site resistance, then it does not confer resistance to other herbicide target. It is very specific to a particular site of action of herbicide. Whereas the metabolic resistance is a very challenging phenomenon. Here, the weeds, if they have metabolic resistance, they can confer resistance to other herbicide targets as well. I'm going to spend a little more time on metabolic resistance later in my presentation. 
So this chart uh, shows the global um, number of uh, cases in terms of herbicide resistance in weeds. As you can see, uh, the number of weeds that are resistant to herbicides have increased steadily and steeply in the last two and a half uh, uh, decades or so. Here, the scenario in the US is not any different from a global scenario. Again, we have seen steady increase in number of cases of herbicide resistance in wheat. But even more important or more challenging is that currently we see a lot of wheat species evolving resistance to more than one site of action of herbicide. So if we have wheat, a number of weeds with such multiple resistance, then it gives very few options for us to manage these weeds. Therefore, there is a need for new herbicide chemistries to discover and uh, make available to combat herbicide resistance. So the two other talks following mine uh, would be focusing on uh, the new herbicide chemistries. And I'm also really excited about those talks. So as I mentioned, I want to also give you an overview of uh, glyphosate or Roundup resistant crops, as well as uh, Roundup resistance in wheat species. As you can see here in this graph, upon introduction of Roundup ready trade uh, technology, majority of corn, cotton, or soy being grown here in the US and also many other uh, developed countries, um, they grow Roundup ready uh, uh, trade uh, consisted crops of these. So as you can see, more than 90% of acreage of these crops uh, uh, grown here in the US contain Roundup ready trait. Because of this, obviously there is extensive use of uh, glyphosate in these uh, cropping systems. Consequently, we have seen evolution of uh, herbicide resistance in uh, or glyphosate resistance in weed population. Globally, there are 55 weeds that are uh, known to be resistant to glyphosate. 17 of those are present here in the US. The, another unique aspect of uh, this herbicide glyphosate is that, you remember all the mechanisms of target site and non-target site resistant that I alluded earlier? All those have been documented for the herbicide glyphosate, uh, of course, in different weed species. One, one such mechanism is um, gene amplification or gene duplication based resistance to glyphosate. This mechanism was first documented for this herbicide glyphosate. Here, what uh, happens is the herbicide target gene, which is enol pyruvyl shikimate phosphate synthase, in short, APSPS, this target uh, uh, gene or the gene coding for this enzyme duplicated uh, several folds, thereby the glyphosate resistant plant showing this mechanism can survive glyphosate application and uh, function normally. In this regard, one of the most fascinating findings that came out of uh, our lab recently was uh, the EPSPS gene amplification has been seen in an extra circular chromosomal DNA, extra chromosomal circular DNA here. So this extra chromosomal circular DNA consisting the EPSPS gene amplified several folds. And as you can see in this um, picture, all those pink dots refer to amplified copies of EPSPS. EPSPS gene. So because of this massive amplification, there is sufficient enzyme available for the plant to function normally even after application of glyphosate. So I did mention that uh, if we have metabolic resistance in wheat, uh, then it could be really a challenge for the management. So why is it so? Um, in that a sense, uh, all plants, including weeds, have certain enzymes known as cytochrome P450s or glutathione S transferases. These enzymes are there for plant um, to protect them from the biotic and abiotic stresses. So if we have increased activity of these enzymes, then while 
protecting the plant from the stresses, they can also act upon the herbicide molecules and degrade them or making them inactive in the plant. So when you have increased activity of these uh, enzymes, they not only work on one particular chemistry or one site of action of herbicide and degrade them, they also work on multiple herbicides with different chemistries. That's the reason if we have stacking and accumulation of these enzymes, this will be a challenge because the plant would be predisposed to have evolved resistant to other herbicide molecules as well. So how do we manage resistance? This is the really key thing for growers in terms of controlling the weeds that are resistant to herbicide. So again, there is no simple answer for this. It has to be a systems approach. I borrowed this cartoon from Crop Life where they clearly show multiple tactics need to be followed for managing weed resistance. So farmers should be looking at crop rotations or using cover crops as weed suppression strategy or use multiple herbicides with different modes of action. Essentially, the mantra here is that you need to follow integrated weed management involving multiple tactics. Again, if weed has a target site resistance, then mixing or rotating different herbicide chemistries can be very, very effective to manage such resistance. However, if we have metabolic resistance, then that strategy will not be effective and we need to look at multiple strategies. And more importantly, we should look at reducing the wheat seed bank. So to conclude, um, I am an optimist. I believe the opportunity still exists. Um, stewardship is extremely important in this case. And also we have to emphasize on transdisciplinary research, bringing multiple expertise to come up with uh, strategies to manage herbicide resistance and also increase public private partnerships. And more importantly, effective communication. We need to get the extension uh, scientists as well as um, uh, field days to be conducted on a regular basis and also through social media convey the message of importance of herbicide resistance, how growers can tackle that uh, uh, to manage resistance. So with that, I thank you all for your patience listening and also thank my past and present group members and I can take any questions you may have, I'm sorry. Thank you very much for that interesting uh, presentation. I don't see any uh, questions currently in the uh, question window. Uh, so for participants, if you would like to ask a question, please type it in and, and we will pass it on. Um, so I guess without further ado then, since I don't, um, oh, I do have a question coming in. Um, uh, so the, the question uh, coming in is, uh, what detection of, of herbicide resistance would be most effective? So how could you find new ways to look at herbicide resistance? Oh, what would be the most uh, uh, perfect way of detecting herbicide resistance? Yeah. So there are multiple methods that we use to detect herbicide resistance. I, in my opinion, most reliable one is we need to test them at a whole plant level under greenhouse conditions. If you suspect a population of weed that has resistance, we need to ask the grower or we, we can go ourselves and get the seed and grow them in a controlled environment and uh, treat those plants with the herbicide that is uh, uh, potentially uh, the weed is resistant to. And then also, in my opinion, we need to make sure the trait is transferred to next generation. Basically, let those plants that survive herbicide application and generate seed from those survivors and test the next generation if the trait is transferred or inherited in the next generation, then that would be the confirmation, best confirmation that we have resistance in the population. Uh, thank you. Uh, once we prompted, we got a lot of questions. I'll save those till uh, till the end. I, I think moving right along, we'll move on to our next speaker, Dr. Len Jens Lukro. Uh Jens is head of herbicide and early biology at BASF Corporation's agricultural research station located in Limburghof, Germany. 
He supervises research on modes of action, herbicide resistance and uptake, and the transport and metabolism of herbicides. Jens, take it away. Yes, thank you very much for the kind introduction. The great organization, and thanks to the organizers for inviting me to give this, yeah, 100, 200 feet overview, like you see here uh, on the farmer's field on how to get new herbicides. So I'll see, I think it works well here with uh, moving the slides. And I would like to connect to what Mathila said. Yeah, and you say, you can't harvest seeds without killing weeds. Weeds are yield robbers number one. And in line with Global HRAC, the Herbicide Resistance Action Committee and Crop Life International, indeed, it's important to use integrated pest management to keep our sharp weapons sharp. Otherwise, uh, yeah, the efficacy will erode. Actually, we're living in a period of time, and this is an example from the EU, where two of three pesticides will be banned due to new regulatory hurdles. And where out of the thousand compounds that were available, only two to 300 will remain. And for four actives leaving the market, only one new will enter the market. And that means for the different segments, we will have much less solutions in the future. And that also puts a special uh, pressure on resistance management because the options getting fewer. So we need new sharp weapons. And that in the context of societal demand, where uh, the society takes a critical look at metabolites, residues, and even when you get a registration, retailers say, okay, we don't ex accept the maximum residue levels that are defined, we just accept 20%. So it goes beyond the mere regulatory scheme, but the regulatory authorities, of course, are driven uh, by the public opinion and um, po uh, policy makers. There are numerous and region specific study requirements um, and the lately released Endangered Species Act in the US is one of it, but we also have a lot of discussion in Europe about water preservation and with the Green Deal of the EU, the cutting of the herbicides or the pesticides in, by half, also a pressure on the use rate. So the new compounds that we were looking at have a higher attrition rate uh, due to the higher thresholds and there are more hurdles to overcome. And that is a special requirement and challenge for us because we have to foresee within the long time to develop these uh, compounds, the new requirements in advance. And where the easy answer to what does it take to make a new herbicide as well, imagine it takes $50 every minute for 11 years. That is roughly the effort and around 250 million euros. You have to screen a lot. You have to fail early because it's so expensive to fail late. So we really need good indicator assays in early research, looking for new chemistries to really develop and advance the right compounds. And very often the knockout is the regulatory uh, framework. So we have to look for the compounds that can be registered. And it's not necessarily always the ones that show highest efficacy. So we have to look for new solutions to get the products into, through the pipeline into the market. So one key message here is if you fail, fail early uh, in order to save the resources because it's already quite costly to bring products to market. And there are not that many companies driven by innovation and new actives. Uh, consolidation of the market has led to basically now six major companies doing active research. And these companies in relative terms uh, lose market share. So it's the time of the generic compound companies um, uh, with less new actors being found. So the market share eroded by about 18% in only six years. And uh, that's remarkable. And the good big companies, of course, uh, try to get them more, more uh, productive in order to get new products to market. When you take a look at a press release last month, what has shown up as new products uh, in the first quarter, you'll realize, and also taking a look back, that life cycle management uh, products dominate the new products going to market. So you have new combinations of known chemistries uh, combined in a new way, maybe with a tank mix option or with different use rates or with a new formulation in order to combat the key weeds, be it uh, dicots or monocot weeds. When we take a look at chemistries that came to market the last five years, there are actually only eight actives. 
and largely known mode of action. So new variations of chemistries that are known for quite some time. Um, also synmethylene here in green uh, is an old mode of action, but it has found a new market segment and their site of action was newly discovered. When you take a look into the near future, 2022 and 24 and beyond, there are a few compounds to come and two are truly new modes of action. One is a pyrimidine biosynthesis inhibitor, dihydro or hydrogenase, and the other one is basically following HPVD, the homogenesis solanisotransferase. These are two products uh, that go into uh, paddy rice or rice there where it's selective. Uh, a number of companies, of course, are working in this field and a few uh, um, a new patents have been published. The other compounds, there's a shift to some Asian companies that, and especially King Egg Root, is a new emerging player since the last decade. Basically, they're looking into food security in China, then bring products mainly to China. When you then take a look at where can we actually get chemistries from, what are the main sources? You can do mass screening, you can use natural compounds. You can do Me Too patent watch. So what are the others doing? Like I just showed you on the chemistry, the new modes of action. You can uh, work on old targets with new uh, chemical modifications. You can do database mining. You might have had some interesting compounds which you did not follow due to a different strategy. So synmethylene is such a case. Uh, you can use antibacterials. The plastid is a very interesting target for herbicides. And uh, in, according to the Anderson Beyond uh, theory, uh, this is an organelle that comes from bacteria. So they share a lot of targets. So you can screen hundreds of thousands of antibacterials known in literature. You can use open innovation. You can exchange uh, with you know, compounds with pharma companies if you don't have uh, uh, the same arena. Uh, and don't work on the same areas. You can use herbicide discovery companies. You can acquire license or uh, co-develop uh, products. And there are new technologies addressing the finding new herbicides, which I will show you in a few minutes. Um, the old way to address it is, okay, we need new chemistry. Let's buy a few hundred thousand compounds. And there are a number of suppliers on the market. Uh, who offer it, and we have to apply a filtering system which follows certain criteria like uh, the Lipinski rules, molecular weight, lipophilicity, chemical structure, hydrogen bonding, and other criteria. You don't want to have anything among there that's highly reactive, explosive, or other things, and you need very experienced people. Um, they're eye eyeballing, gut feeling, paired with new approaches like machine learning. Uh, uh, algorithms to select compounds. And here is an example. In 2010, we bought 100,000 compounds. Each compound was 9 to 15 euros. It cost you 0.9 to 1.5 million. When you take a look at this today, prices have gone up tremendously. And this is most probably not the future way to screen millions of uh, molecules anymore. Therefore, companies are looking for new ways to access chemistry. One is open innovation. So you can basically join several of the companies uh, by just sending your molecules. You never might have never intended to test it uh, for effects on weeds, fungi, insects, or insects. You just uh, go to the websites of the companies and take a look at their contacts on open innovation. And also my colleague, Anna Mikrasko, will be happy to re receive any input there. But there are also other companies out doing it the same way. Um, there are numerous new players in the area of herbicide discovery. And here you see a list of a few companies. It's not complete, but you see companies like Mo Technology having uh, some certain new technologies and modules available. You see, you see Jingdao King Egg Root, uh, mainly focusing on China. And you could, of course, think of uh, moving with those compounds uh, global. Fortifast in Israel, EncoChem in the US work on bioinformatics approaches. You have Maron Bioscience uh, working on um, natural compounds, Harpid Bioherbicide. You have Ecplinus uh, that just worked on in silicon um, uh, models and they advertise for the APH1 compound. You see other companies from either university or industry. The latest company going uh, into the arena is Mankind Agrotech from India. It's basically Danuka, a pharmaceutical company that wants to capitalize on their uh, expertise in, uh, in, with their chemical libraries. And there are others. So you can basically look and see, get in contact and test and potentially invest if there's something interesting, because not all the companies are able to bring products to the market and spend the 240 million at the end. 
Um, when you take a look at our current situation, how many herbicides do we have? Um, on the Ichuk post, you'll find 25 known, mo known modes of action and uh, 264 herbicides that are listed. Um, 16 compounds have an unknown mode of action and six more basically represent the great value of the market. So one question could be, why so few targets and how many herbicide targets exist? We've tried to answer at least one part of the question and did a literature and pattern research uh, or search. And we found at least 203, 31 targets of which 62 are chemically validated, 191 are genetically validated by antisense RNA and knockouts are the other means. And you can see the distribution here around uh, the different, many different functions. What's interesting is many of the uh, uh, steps or uh, components here are located in the plastid, like lipid metabolism, chlorophyll biosynthesis, but also fatty acid biosynthesis, photosynthesis, photorespiration, uh, sugar metabolism. So obviously the antimicrobials and the plastid is a very good target. Very often it has uh, targets that have no homology to humans, mammals, and very often the protein function is limiting plant growth and there are catastrophic downstream effects. So what you need as a good target is a good screening system and you need drug ability. So why are there so many theoretical targets, but only a relatively known number of targets is, is addressed by chemistries? Most probably the reason is that not all targets are druggable. A study in the past uh, tried to better understand what are the mainstream uh, characteristics of a binding pocket uh, and uh, what makes it a good herbicide, yeah, uh, for a good herbicide. Uh, 60 drug targets were compared that have crystal structures uh, and uh, it was compared with the subset of oligand bound proteins in the public domain. A, an algorithm was applied or developed and applied to as isolate basically the relevant binding pocket parameters. And the main finding is that the size of the pocket, the depth of the hydrophobicity range in the binding pocket and the subset channel, the amino acid charges uh, in the pocket and the enclosure are key parameters for protein druggability. This is the mainstream rule. So the majority of, uh, of compounds more, most probably has to fit this rule, but there are clear exceptions. For example, uh, and uh, enzymes with small binding sites like HPBD, the EPSPS synthase, or, um, or also the glutamine synthase. HPBD requires an iron chelating motif, uh, meaning nitrogen or oxygen uh, containing groups, and glyphosate and glufosinate are one hit wonders. So, obviously, there's a reason why this protein is uh, not draggable, and there are only a few exceptions escaping this mainstream rule. Furthermore, if we take a look at uh, other ways to access new chemistries, can we model new herbicides in silico? In principle, yes, we can. There are several companies claiming to have new early in silico leads in the pipeline. Um, massive funding goes into this area. You might know Atom Wise that uh, got a 45 million uh, fund by a consortium of different investors uh, working on neur neural uh, networks for bioactivity prediction and structure-based design. And just lately, Bayer invested in Progeny Akam, an Israel-based company that's working on in silico prediction, especially on protein-protein interaction. And the claim is made there, well, the crop protection market, like the pharma market, will slowly but surely adopt novel artificial intelligence discovered small molecules. So uh, I think it's clear with time going by, diversity of the approaches tried and the resources poured into it, there is an increase of probability of success. With the claim of several companies having new in silico leads, it's still too early to see the candidates at the front end of the pipeline, but it looks like they will come very soon. And you do not always need uh, big company money. You can also use uh, academic sources for pocket druggability prediction like uh, at the university with a tour of the of, uh, University of Paris. Furthermore, the real strength of modeling is the refinement of the lead structure, the optimization. Uh, when you already have large data sets, you can use those to learn from them and to basically with the structural biology data, rationally optimize the molecule. One example is triflidum oxazine tyrexo, which binds in the binding pocket of PPO, and that has a beta wall 
uh, so uh, in, in the mining pocket. And um, this was used, this information was used to find specific binders to the beta wall. They were found and introduced to the molecule. And we have now additional anchors on the molecule. So resistance that might be caused by one amino acid to other molecules does not affect trifidium and oxidim the same way because you have more binding in the pocket and single mutations uh, on the PO2 enzyme do not, uh, do not harm the, in the, the binding of the inhibitor. Uh, we see in greenhouse and field trials that it still inhibits the target site resistance in the field. So that's one new sharp weapon that will go to market in the future. Um, in order to find new draggable targets, um, you can basically hijack a principle that's called PROTAG. It's uh, hijack ubiquitinylation, uh, tagging the protein for degradation. So you combine a binder, you do not need an inhibitor, a binder. A binder is that's less complex to find. That's a hit of binding a protein. Nice uh, uh, screening systems available for it. Then you combine it with a linker and with a molecule that binds to the E3 ligase. So if you bring the, uh, the pro uh, protein of interest in contact with the E3 ligase, the protein of interest gets tagged with ubiquitin and degraded. And that is great because you can uh, now use undruggable targets uh, that are important for growth. So one of the 191 targets that have been shown before and hopefully get new herbicides. The challenge is you have to, of course, optimize several components. The molecule gets bigger, sometimes also cost of goods. Uh, one concern is you need real metabolic stability because a bigger molecule offers more attack groups and uptake is very important because with a molecule weight above 500, you'll have uh, less efficient solutions to bring the compound into the plant to basically get it over the cuticula and the cell wall. And finally, RNAi technology is around. It was uh, yeah, promoted 10 years ago and started. We see quite some significant um, successes, especially in bee health, in the use as insecticides. It works very well on larvae system of bean beetle, of flea beetle, of colorated potato beetle. We also see some successes on fungicides. We will see very little uh, reports on herbicides because there again, the delivery, how to get a large polar and charged molecule through the leaf surface is an unsolved challenge. And of course, at the end, it's also a matter of the use rate and the cost of goods, um, whether such a solution could be brought to market. So far, we require abrasive methods, mechanical wounding or stomata flooding through spreaders to get some of the material into the system, but it's not yet a robust system to combat weeds, but it would be a great tool if we can overcome uh, this challenge with new innovation because it could really resharpen our herbicide tools. And finally, there is one more technology that's the DNA encoded libraries. You can synthesize DNA barcodes and do chemistry on the backbone of the DNA. The DNA barcode is used really as a, uh, a flag to identify the molecule that gets screened in target biochemistry. And uh, this is done together with different companies, either in vitro or even in vivo. You can deconvolute the results uh, sequence and then know which chemistry is basically on the backbone of the DNA that was synthesized. Of course, you can only use chemistry that does not damage the DNA, uh, but it gives you billions of molecules, a great chemical space, to look for a new target chemistry that could be further uh, tested and optimized for the lead structure. And uh, I would like to conclude with this slide. There are many nice new technologies out there and all these in vitro assays lead to many hits. And, but the key question is, are these chemistry active on whole plant level? And therefore you need systems to test it in a higher throughput. This is an example. You see soil earth trays, 96 well trays uh, with two monocots and a dicot and a pre-emergence and a post-emergence setting in order to indicate whether there's an initial effect yeah, on the plant. Because we realized that this good uptake 
parameters are basically an intrinsic characteristic of the hit lead. And it's very hard to, uh, to define that de novo. So uh, you really need some good chem uh, chemical hits that have an activity on the plant for further optim lead optimization. And I think this is one of the key hurdles in finding new chemistries. With that said, I would very much like to thank you for your attention. And just remember, at the end, it's really finding the right balance for success to have a regulatory OK product, but one which really solves the problems and has a key unique value for the farmer. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Jens, and thank all of you for typing in your questions. Uh, we have many for the uh, for the end period, uh, question and answer period. But I do have one, I think a couple people touched on uh, on regulatory. You mentioned it just there at the end, Jens. Can, can you circle back and talk about what the, uh, what the regulatory burden is and whether there are new advances that may help to bring materials to market and what are the advantages and disadvantages of, of getting things faster to market? Well, uh, I think the disadvantage of getting things faster to market is that you increase uncertainty and risk because uh, you have to basically live with limited information. And as you go in parallel with all the different studies, you might be catch unawares on the wrong foot and uh, a, a, a parameter might not fit to really meet the, the hurdle. So that's why it's so important to have early indicator assays that allow us to really throw, throw out the bad candidates from the good ones. But we still need more than one candidate, but a few backups for the further phase in the optimization to learn about our chemistries and to see whether there's a pitfall. And sometimes it's just one group on the whole molecule that makes the big difference. Either in the kinetics and the animal that you see an effect or you don't see an effect at all because maybe it's not taken up. So uh, the risk really is higher because we have to go in parallel, we have to make early decisions and we have to speed up the process. And yeah, risk, hopefully versus payout. And we have to really focus on the ones that are regulatory wise okay. And that can lead to a good solution. Not necessarily one uh, molecule that really has the highest efficacy. Really re registration and the requirements and toxicology, ecotoxicology and the EFAID drive it. For Europe, the highest attrition rate is the leaching potential. So if you find something in groundwater, it's a knockout for a herbicide in, uh, in, in Europe. And uh, this, this can be tested early on. And toxicology, ecotoxicology have made quite some advancements in their early prediction tools. And this is very important and also building up artificial intelligence and gathering data sets in order to increase predictivity on, uh, on our new lead molecules. Very good. Thank you so much for that. Um, I think now we'll segue to our next speaker. Thank you again, Jens. Our next speech, speaker is Dr. Stephen O. Duke. Um, many of you have asked questions about biologicals. I think you're going to be uh, in for some uh, interesting learning here. Steve is a principal scientist at the University of Mississippi School of Pharmacy. He is an authority of the modes, on the modes of action and resistance to herbicides. He has extensively focused on glyphosate. Natural phytotoxins that may form the basis of future herbicides is now an area where he is very active. That's the focus of his presentation today. So without further ado, Steve, the floor is yours. Thanks, Mark. And thanks to the organizers for inviting me to, uh, to speak uh, today in this very interesting webinar. Uh, trying to uh, advance the slide. Okay, uh, this part of the webinar will deal with natural products as a source of new herbicide targets. And uh, now I'm trying to advance again. I've got some animation here. Uh, about 17% of commercial pesticides are either natural products or clearly derived from natural products. However, only 7%, next click. Yes, only 7% of commercial herbicides are derived from natural 
products. And the, the, the hatch bars represent pesticides that could have been inspired by natural compounds. The gray bars are those that are purely synthetic. The royalty value of natural product and natural product derived pesticides and herbicides. Uh, next click again. And next one. I'm not sure why I can't control it, but uh, next click. You can see the actual value of these natural product derived pesticides and herbicides is higher than the actual number of commercial compounds. Next slide. Uh, and click through these as I speak about them. Uh, there are several advantages of natural product based herbicides. They're likely to have a shorter environmental half-life uh, than, than many synthetic compounds. And nature has screened countless compounds for biological activity and very often the biological activity might be utilized as a, as a pesticide. They can be produced by biosynthesis, which has uh, become more important as uh, new technologies have been uh, elaborated. Next slide, our next click. Uh, they can have resistance genes associated with the genes for synthesis, and these genes can be imparted into crops to make the crop resistant to the natural product that can be used as a herbicide. And they're more likely to have multiple target sites. There are no commercial herbicides that have more than one target sites, but there are some compounds in nature that are phytotoxic via more than one target site. Next slide. Our next. And often, but not always, they have novel modes of action, which is the focus of, of most of what I'm going to talk about. Next slide. There's some caveats, though. Often they have the wrong physical chemical properties to be a good pesticide. Uh, Jens mentioned Lipinski's rules for pharmaceuticals and Tice's, Colin Tice's rules for pesticides. Very often these natural products don't fit those rules. And for, the, for those reasons, they don't have the right chemical properties to be good pesticides. Molecular complexity is often very challenging which means the cost is very high. Even for pharmaceuticals, some of these natural products are exorbitantly complex and therefore very expensive. Next. And generating simpler, cheaper, and more effective analogs may not work. Evolution may have maximized activity. Next. Mammalian toxicity is an issue with some of these. Natural is not always safe. Uh, some of the most toxic compounds known are natural products. Next. And the environmental half-life may be too short to be effective. Um, to be effective as a pesticide, the compound has to stick around long enough to kill the target organism. There's several commercial herbicides, as I mentioned, that are from natural sources that you can see here. I've listed them. Those from plants are in green. Those from microbes are in purple. Uh, there's one from an insect that's in red. And they have some interesting target sites. Next slide. Uh, blue phosphate is one of the more successful compounds from a natural source. It's from a soil mite, Streptomyces, which produces l phosphenothricin which is an irreversible binder of glutamine synthetase. And uh, the synthesized version of this uh, racemic mixture of the DNL forms of phosphenothricin are sold under several trade names as a very successful herbicide. Uh, uh, you, the Streptomyces also has a gene for resistance to l phosphenothricin and this is used to make some crops resistant to it, which makes the product even more valuable. So it's been a very successful herbicide. Next slide, please. Next. Uh, a good example of a herbicide inspired by a natural compound is from the bottle brush plant. Uh, keep clicking through. And uh, it produces a very phytotoxic compound called Leptospermona triketone. And Imperial Chemical Industries developed this into mesotriol, which were, was one of the first HPPD inhibitors that, that Jens mentioned, and several uh, triketone uh, herbicides are on the market now. Um, 
that were all derived from a natural plant compound. There is a category of HPPD inhibitors that were purely synthetic though. Next. Uh, Synlepilin, a, uh, a herbicide that Jens mentioned, may have originated from 1,4-Seniol, which is a natural monoterpene. Uh, it simply, 1,4-Seniol uh, with some other molecular baggage, it was discovered by next uh, shell, and after several consolidations, just click, keep clicking through it, uh, ended up with BASF next. And uh, it's been sold under tr several trade names. Uh, it's been introduced, it's being sold in Australia now. And next, and BASF found the actual molecular target sites, which was unique at the time. It inhibits ACLs, ACP thioesterase or a fatty acid thioesterase uh, that uh, is involved in synthesis of mid chain link fatty acids. There are other herbicides that inhibit other. Uh, stages of fatty acid synthesis. There is a purely synthetic compound, the thiazolin, which was recently found to also inhibit fatty acid thioesterases. Next slide, please. Uh, cantharidin is a uh, old pharmaceutical compound produced by blister beetles, which it, to be active has to be converted to cantharidic acid. As you can see, it's very structurally similar to endothol, which is a pretty old herbicide. Uh, the, only, the only differences are two methyl groups. And uh, we recently found that uh, it has a unique target site and inhibits serine three, uh, threonine protein phosphatase. And it's the only herbicide known to uh, have this particular target site. Next slide, please. Next. So many natural phytotoxins have novel modes of action that are not shared by commercial herbicides. And I'm gonna go through a few of these, but these are only a few. Uh, an example is hydantocidin, which was discovered by Sankyo in Japan uh, over 30 years ago. Uh, it's produced by an, a streptomyces species. It has similar activity to glyphosate on seven monocot and 10 dicot species, but it has a different, very different mode of action on glyphosate. Uh, next click, please. It's a proherbicide that must be phosphorylated in planta to inhibit adenylosuccinate synthetase, which is a unique target site not shared by any commercial herbicides. And quite a bit of effort has been put into trying to develop hydantocidin and derivatives of hydantocidin as a herbicide by several different companies, but so far, no, uh, no commercial product. Next, please. A similar uh, situation is with corn existing another Sankyo compound uh, from, a, from a fungus, I think growing uh, on uh, dung in Canada, if I remember right, and it inhibits the transketolase uh, involved in plant carbon metabolism. Uh, partial knockouts of that gene give a phenotype very similar to treating a plant with corn existent. And BASF has a patent for a altered transketolase that makes crops resistant to it if, you, if it were a, uh, a uh, successful commercial herbicide. Next, please. Uh, recently, uh, Drummond Lab uh, discovered this uh, uh, exotic sugar from a cyanobacterium uh, you can see that its activity is at least as good as glyphosate in this particular bioassay. Uh, as most of you know, and as was mentioned by Bithla, uh, glyphosate inhibits EPSPS, uh, one of the last enzymes in the shikimic acid pa pathway. This uh, particular toxin inhibits dehydro quinate synthase, you can click the next one and you'll see that enzyme. So it's inhibiting the shikimate pathway at a different target site. Uh, so far that has not developed into a uh, commercial product yet. Next. Uh, another recent discovery was that aspartic acid, which is produced by a soil fungus, Aspergillus terius. Uh, this compound was known to be a phytotoxin, but the mode of action was not known. The, 
mode of action was discovered by this group by finding that uh, with the genes for synthesis of uh, this particular compound in aspergillus was a gene for uh, dihydroxy acid dehydratase, one of the last enzymes in the branch chain amino acid synth pathway, uh, click and uh, you'll, there we go. Uh, and this, this is a target site that's not uh, found in any commercial herbicide. The, the other oval there is over acetolactate synthase, which is a target site of a very large number of commercial herbicides. So that pathway has been very uh, productive in terms of herbicides, but only centered on one enzyme. This particular compound is good at inhibiting a later enzyme in the pathway. So this indicates that it is druggable and you can kill plants by inhibiting that. Uh, but again, no commercial product yet with this target site. Next. Marone Bioinnovations is a small company in California involved in microbial bioherbicides. And one of those uh, particular compounds, MBI-014, is a Burkholdia rhinogensis, which is a soil microbe that the, they have found has two active phytotoxins. And their product will be killed Burkholdia rhinogensis that contains these two compounds sprayed on the crops to kill them. Uh, so they determine these two compounds are in their product. Uh, next slide, please. We found that the romadepsin inhibits uh, histone deacetylase and that the reduced form of the uh, compound is much more active than the oxidized form. Uh, Next slide, please. Uh, it's interesting that a few years earlier, a German lab found that the benzoxenoids, which are allelochemicals produced by some uh, grass crops like wheat, uh, are converted to a compound, click one more click, please, called APO, which is much more toxic to plants than the benzoxenoids. And these are actually what, what are causing most of the damage to competing weeds in these crops. They found that APO is also a histone deacetylase inhibitor, indicating that there's a, there are there's several different chemistries from natural products that, that are phytotoxic via this mode of action. Next slide, please. Here you see the relative potency of spliceostatin C, the other uh, phytotoxin produced in MBI-014. And you can see on pigweed, which is one of the most virulent weeds in North America now, it's much more active on a grams per hectare level than several commercial herbicides. Uh, very active at a half a gram per hectare. Next slide, please. Uh, we worked on the mode of action of splicestatin C, and I show herboxidiene uh, also, which is a Monsanto compound from several de decades ago, both produced by uh, microbes, both selective herbicides. Uh, herboxidine lowers cholesterol and it's a non splicing inhibitor. Uh, spliceostatin C is an analog of spliceostatin A, an anti cancer agent and splicing inhibitor, and a, and a selective herbicide. Next slide. And since those splicing inhibitors, they interfere with the spliceosome, uh, causing intron retention. And uh, we found uh, looking at a number of genes that you do get intron retention. Uh, the uh, mRNA is not processed properly. So you get a number of different, if you have several introns, you get a number of different uh, misspliced versions of mRNA. Uh, here you see tubulin M8 subunit of the spliceosome is also affected. Uh, next slide, please. As a result, you get uh, improper proteins. Here you see all the proteins that, that, that are affected by spliceostatin C and Arabidopsis. These are the ones that are statistically significantly affected by a very low dose of spliceostatin C. Next slide, slide please. 
and we did molecular docking studies and found that uh, spliceostatin C there that you see in purple uh, does bind between a couple of the subunits of the uh, spliceosome. Next slide, please. So uh, to summarize in this cartoon, you see that you, you get retention of introns in resulting in incorrect translation, inactive proteins, and proteins that are translated and folded wrong. Next slide, please. So there are advantages of a product like this. Bethel had mentioned that uh, one of the strategies for resistance management is to use more than one mode of action. Here in one product, you have two target sites in the same product that can be used for resistance management. And you have two different totally two different chemistries for, not, for herbicide non-target site resistance management. It's possible that, uh, that enzymes that metabolize one of these will not metabolize the other one. So there's a, there's a chance that it could also uh, be used to fight a tar, uh, non-target site resistance management that's based on met metabolic resistance. Next slide, please. So in summary, only a small, small fraction, fraction of commercial herbicides are derived from natural compounds. However, uh, the commercial herbicides derived from natural compounds have very unique modes of action. Natural phytotoxins have many molecular targets not utilized by commercial herbicides. And some of these are very effective targets indicating that these targets are druggable at least by the natural products that are very effective on them. So uh, this suggests that there are several more uh, target sites that can be enlisted in the, the ex exploration for new herbicides. And with that, next slide. I thank the people that did the work that came from our lab and thanks for listening. Thank you very much, Steve. Uh, I guess I, one somewhat clarifying question here. Um, seems like there's a lot of interest in the question, the questioners around purely biological um, herbicides. It, uh, I did a non-scientific study. I went to my local garden supply place, walked in, and the only thing that was labeled an all-natural herbicide was a bottle of 30% acetic acid, which they were basically saying apply, you know, directly to plants at 30%. That, that wasn't really what I was seeking. Are, are there, if I wanted, and we'll just not talk about the reasons I might want them, but, or whether they're valid, if I wanted a purely natural herbicide, I could walk in a store today and buy, is there such a thing? I mentioned pelargonic acid. That's a natural compound. I'm not sure whether what's sold is synthesized or derived from a natural source, but it is a natural compound. And it's a good deal more active than acetic acid. It's a nine carbon uh, fatty acid. Uh, but uh, and there there are there are other products that are mixtures of organic acids, et cetera, that that are approved by by the uh, the uh, are recommended by the organic gardening organizations. But they, in terms of using them for broad scale agriculture to control weeds with those products, is much more expensive and much less efficacious. Okay. Uh, there's there's a lot of work out there on using microbial biopesticides. This uh, NBI 014 is an example of one, and uh, that that uh, those products have really not gone. There have been a number of commercial products that have been on the market, and they haven't really done very well. We're having an OE, OECD symposium in Italy uh, this fall that is trying to get at the reasons why these, the technical reasons why these products have not worked very well. Uh, I think with new technologies, there is some hope that some of these microbial bio herbicides can be efficacious and economical in the future. Um, it does seem like, and maybe I'm incorrect, so please correct me. It, it seems like there's a big difference between the, the pesticides where plants seem to have developed things that we can, more or less pull from the plant in its natural native form and be effective against 
insect pests and other things. Is there a re is there an underlying reason that that isn't so easy in herbicides? Well, uh, autotoxicity is an issue. Uh, plants that make herbicidal compounds can poison themselves. Okay. So from an evolutionary standpoint, uh, it's much easier for the plant to make compounds that kill fungi and insects without poisoning themselves than to make highly efficacious herbicidal compounds. And that's a whole other issue that uh, uh, the most potent natural compounds in terms of phytotoxicity are produced by microbes, especially plant pathogens that kill weeds. They tend to make very highly potent phytotoxins that kill the food before they eat it. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, there's a, a great deal of information on these compounds, uh, but they tend to be very complicated compounds. Some of them are fairly toxic to humans also, uh, but it, they are examples. They do prove that certain new targets are very effective for, could be very effective for herbicides. Okay. Uh, well, why, why don't we now formally uh, start our question and answer period? So if we can bring back in our other speakers, please. And so uh, again, please keep your questions coming. Um, I, I'll start with a, a question that, that relates to something that someone uh, pointed or so, another question. And this is uh, 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 for Mathilda. Um, you had a plot of unique resistance cases and it maxed out in the U.S. at 160. What, what defines a case? Is that a, an individual weed species or is that a weed species in a particular spot or what, what, what does that mean? Okay, um, we, those individuals we call biotypes in weed science, it could be within the same species, there could be different biotypes from different populations. That's what I meant. Individual cases would be a same species in US or Canada evolving resistance to same herbicide. That would be a unique case uh, here in the US or in multiple places in the US as well. Okay. It could be within the same species, different biotypes as well. Okay. And the 160 should sound like a lot to us or it should sound like a little to us? <laughs> okay, it's a, an interesting question. If that 160 contains several of those agriculturally important weeds, like, you know, sometimes you have weeds on the roadside, which may not be very specific to agricultural fields, then we should be worrying in terms of crop production uh, issues. So it all depends on the what are the prominent weed species we see in our uh, cropping systems. It could be different for different crops as well. See the weeds, different weeds emerge at different period of times, right? The weeds that are specific to corn may not be the same for sorghum or milo, so right. Okay. Well, that opens up kind of an interesting lead in, uh, uh, which is a question is open to all. If we frequently talk about the, the crops that are, are grown here in the US and in the industrialized world. If we, if we talk for a moment about potential for developing world or, um, or new crops, and, and new, I guess I'll put in parentheses, things like cassava, uh, other, uh, what did I see, sorghum, my, you know, all these other things that people are saying we should be eating more of. Uh, uh, what should we be doing relative to, to commercial herbicides around those types of crops? And I'll open it to anyone who wants to answer. Uh, I'll start. Uh, so in even in the new crops that you are referring, even in US, there is a lot of emphasis on growing for uh, millet production. We do have a research um, program on small grains and millet. So in that situation also, again, we have to look at the period or a time during the year at which these crops are grown and what are the weeds that are going to emerge. And also depending on the region, sometimes those weeds already have documented to be resistant to herbicide that can work in these crops. So it has to be looked into more detail about where these crops are grown and what type of weeds. And in that situation, we already have resistance. Otherwise, yeah, if there is, I mean, giving an example of uh, 
other countries where herbicide resistance is not such a big issue, then chemical weed control may still work. But again, they should learn the lessons from us, like, you know, just do the uh, multiple strategies and make sure they won't use the same herbicide mode of action over and over again. Jens or Steve, any comments? Yeah, I'm happy to comment. I think sorghum will gain importance because it's, uh, yeah, it doesn't need that much water. And uh, chemistry is the work in corn very often also work well in sorghum. So with less water available, um, sorghum will gain importance. Um, globally, I think uh, the, the highest calorie rate per hectare would come from potatoes. So that's something for developing countries to adopt more. Uh, but I don't think that we'll change uh, the main habits of the people. So I think wheat and rice, corn and soybean, they are the, the big crops. They will remain and we'll need um, this new traits in order to make those uh, crops more resilient. Therefore, all the new breeding technologies are very important. And hopefully all the politicians in the countries of the world will realize that. Yeah. There are more countries now to allow genome editing, like uh, China, like India, and I hope Europe will follow, uh, because that has the potential to speed up uh, breeding and to allow new traits. And I, I, I'm convinced there will be some, some uh, advances uh, with respect to uh, drought resistance uh, and even yield can be increased. Yeah, I didn't hear on your list rice. Is, is, was that purposely excluded? Yeah, or no, no, was rice that... I was included. I'm sorry okay. if I forgot that. Rice is definitely yeah. there. Steve, any comments? You know, well, when it costs $300 million to get a new product to market, the emphasis has to be on new pet herbicides and pesticides that fit those crops. Um, and then uh, some of these crops like millet, it's fine if you have a herbicide or pesticide that works with that particular crop, but uh, the companies that are putting $300 million out to uh, bring a product to market, uh, have to emphasize its utilization on the major crops. Yeah, I guess I'll ask a, a very sweeping uh, question to all of you. Um, all of the presentations took a, a point of, of assuming that herbicides were necessary for agriculture as we know it. And I guess a couple of people have questioned whether that really is true. So can we put a little more meat on that bone, if you will? Can you, can you come back and explain to me why we really need herbicides? Yeah, we, I had a great, could listen to a great presentation by a, 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 economic, a professor for agronomy at the University of Göttingen. He made up the calculation what it would mean to not to use pesticides. Basically, we would cut yield by 40 to 50%, of course, depending on the crop. And what, that, what would that mean for the world, for the developing world, the people who cannot afford the food, the prices will go up. We will foster geopolitical issues. We already today have an issues where 24% of the grain is produced in Ukraine and uh, Russia, and some countries are highly dependent on it. We really need to make sure that we produce enough and then, of course, also allocate it the right way that people have access to it. But if we uh, basically want to go organic, we basically mean you double water consumption, you reduce yield, and unfortunately, also quality. And uh, Mycotoxin is just one part of it. Many people ignore that. If you don't do anything about fungi, you'll have the my higher mycotoxin level in there. And uh, that can lead to severe issues in, in health and also not just in food, also in feed, uh, so feeding the animals. So of course, if we cut our uh, meat consumption, that would help the world a lot. Okay, any comments from our other, other panelists? Um, Another issue too, uh, with regard to herbicides is that at least modern herbicides have greatly reduced the amount of tillage that's required in agriculture mm -hmm. and, and tillage uh, can cause uh, long-term damage to soil and, uh, and sometimes almost irreversible damage to soil. Also, tillage requires a lot of fossil fuels. Fueling. Yep. And uh, uh, post-emergence herbicides reduce tillage by quite a bit, and uh, which, which uh, in terms of fossil fuel use and soil retention uh, 
are very beneficial. Okay. Any other comments from you, Mahit? I, mean, I was going to say no-till no -till is really critical in many parts of the U.S., especially where I am, like Kansas, we, we, because the wind issues and the soil erosion, this no-till to preserve no-till use of herbicide is indispensable. And also, like Jan said, it is economical. So far, farmers have that uh, chemical-based weed control seem to be economical for them in terms of crop uh, productivity. And I think also the principle of selectivity help them like, you know, crops are not affected by herbicides and we can manage weeds. So with all those uh, features, I think chemical weed control will continue to be important in our strategy to manage weeds. Yeah, uh, one add on our nice blue planet has its name because 70% of the surface is water. And when you then further look into deserts, uh, Antarctic, Arctic areas, uh, mountains, uh, seas, etc., there's only one and a half percent of the uh, of the surface of the world available for food production and agriculture. Yep. And this is limited with urbanization. We cannot reactivate uh, huge amounts of uh, of areas without basically destroying the rainforest in Brazil and other countries. Okay, uh, I'll start this one with Jens, but others, please chime in. Um, suppose your dream of a new mode of action comes true, and today you come up with one that's just great. Is it really possible to manage that in a way that resistance will forever be preserved? And if not, if, it, if resistance is inevitable, what does the timeline look like? How, how long before we start seeing things that are resistant? Well, a second glyphosate would help a lot, but not forever. And you need to have integrated pest management because whenever you select, you will enrich certain populations that cope better with the selection pressure. So you really need to uh, integrate uh, all your measures and also go away from just growing corn and soy. Unfortunately, when you take a look at uh, certain regions in the US, you will not be able to buy machinery or find suppliers for uh, other crops. Yeah, for wheat, for example. You don't even find, uh, find the, the, the harvester anymore in those regions. And most probably it's important to really come down to a uh, rotation. Some will have to lose some commercial value. So, so rotation is, a, is another word for reserve. What you need to do is reserve. Yes. Area. Oh, okay. Rotation is one part of the CCMB. It's the chemistry, cultural, ma manual, and biological control. And you have to use all those weapons in order to keep the weapon sharp as long, enough, uh, as, long as possible. I think no mode of action will last forever because uh, there are so many ways how an uh, organism can become resistant. And already in the lab, you have uh, RNAi resistant insects. Yeah, uh, so even that mode of action will not uh, last forever, because there are certain mutations that basically make the uh, uh, diversity that makes the organism uh, cope with this selection pressure better. Yeah. Entropy is a real, a real pain. Huh? <laughs> so, yeah. Yes. So, anybody else got any comments on that? Any, any. Uh, that's a little gloomy outlook. Any any brighter way to interpret that? Well, I guess I think we have to be realistic, and I think pretty accurate. To, yeah. Okay. All right. Um, so so uh, again, I, reading some of the questions here, I, I think that there uh, now you know full disclosure, it's been a while, but for many years, my my butt was in a tractor seat and in a combine seat every year. Uh, so I, I have played in the fields. Um, I, there are modes of that modes of action different uh, is not what I'm looking for. Uh, but but you have pre-emergent, you have post-emergent, you have spot uh, type herbicide applications. Can you kind of go through what the the challenges of each of the different types of herbicides are? As far as whether it's pre-emergent or something that you spray to kill a plant once it's already emerged. Okay. Well, I think. Yep. Go on, please. Go ahead, Jens. I mean. Uh... You, you want me to, uh, the challenges that you asked uh, in terms of use of pre versus post emergence herbicide or spot herbicide, spot application, um, pre-emergence is very, very critical and important uh, mark, but the challenge here is you need activation, like moisture. As soon as you apply pre-emergence herbicide, they should be 
some rain in be this should be there in the forecast or some way we have to get these uh, herbicides activated otherwise they are not going to be effective so why the post emergence herbicides work best is like you know most of these post emergence herbicide applied after the crop part we both emerge and it gets you know easy in terms of application they can go on combine and do and not much activation needed in that regard. And most of, especially as I mentioned, you know, glyphosate is applied as a post-emergence herbicide, foliar herbicide. Right. So uh, growers, once they have their own pretty crops growing, it was pretty easy for them to go and apply a post-emergence. So pre is really good, even some of the resistant weeds that for post herbicide, they could be susceptible to pre herbicide application. But again, um, the challenge is the activation. Any comments from our other speakers? Definitely true, but it's really important to also have a pre emergence uh, application scheme in order to reduce the pressure. And perfect would be to have a herbicide in the future that just does not kill just at the early stage of plant growth, but which will also kill a bit later. Many of the herbicides have a problem that amaranth, for example, grows too fast, and then you have slippage or it doesn't work anymore to kill the plant, uh, the plant because it just outgrows and uh, outcompetes the herbicidal activity. And uh, so the spraying window, the timing is very important for the farmer. And to have the combination of the different modes of action and a rotation of the modes of action from year to year, not just use the same product every year, and uh, that should help to control uh, control the the weeds better. And then it's out also all the companies are monitoring and they have the sales rep and they are looking at the situation and making the recommendation on which products to use in order to combat uh, local uh, resistant weed populations that the problem doesn't spread further into the next county or uh, your state uh, during the season. Okay. Anything to add, Steve? Are you you good? Um, also. Good. Yeah. The, the site specific application more and more advanced technologies are being developed so that you know we can have site specific application that way reduce the amount of herbicide used and also reduce the pressure on so that 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 research is i would say still not uh, very advanced but a lot of progress has been made uh, in wheat science so that is going to be i think in the future people would look into the uh, robotics or site-specific based weed control. Um, we've touched on it a couple of times, but nobody really highlighted it. The, the interaction now between genetics, uh, as in modified genetics and herbicides is very strong. Is that likely to continue in the future? Is the luster gone off of that? And will, will it be, I mean, the actual question was, will it be replaced with some of the technologies that we just mentioned like AI and robotics? Yeah, well, shake his head. <laughs> there's, a, there's, a, there's a clear advancement, but I think not during the next few years. Um, drones are applied already in many uh, countries. Um, that helps a lot uh, uh, the farmer. But um, think about these millions and millions of hectares, and you have to do uh, the screening. You have to go maybe over the field several times. Uh, so you need multiple robots or uh, very smart systems that really are able to combat at the time of emergence, the different flushes. Um, so I think it will first gain importance in the specialty crops, but in the uh, big field crops, it takes longer time or we'll need different solutions. So pre-emergence plus post cleanup with a more, uh, yeah, with a spray. Uh, if you know really, your key areas, your key problems on your fields, where are the population? So digital information helping you, then it can be a solution for quite some farmers. But I doubt that it will be the 100 million acre uh, solution that will take more time. Yeah. Uh, again, this might be a little bit farther out, but but there's one question concerning uh, perennial crops. So several have pointed, I, mean, I, mean, I know literature's out there and there are perennial crops that are grown worldwide. Are, are are perennial crops a solution or more of a problem? Nobody wants to bite on that one. Well, <laughs> uh, I think sugar beet has a similar issue. 
so it's also prone to uh, herbicide resistant weeds. Um, and that's a, uh, yeah, a two year crop basically. Um, you have to uh, put it into soil then and uh, harvest the next season. It's, I, I think. Um, but things like sugar depends. cane, sugar, sugar cane, bananas, things like that, that are, are more perennial. Uh, is weed control still a big issue there? And, and, and does it, does the perennial I, crop make it easier or harder? The sugar cane world is totally different because you have to you know, have a lot of uh, straw coverage, and uh, your herbicides really need to uh, come down to the to the wheat. That's a special challenge. Uh, so it's a very special market, and also a low price market. And I think that's one of the key reasons why paraquat is still used there. Okay, um, I. I uh... We're getting close to the end. I think this will be the final question before our final comments. Uh, I guess I'll direct this one first to Stephen. Uh, I guess people looked at a lot of your structures and were thinking they were relatively large and in, in, in microbial in nature. And I guess our chemist among us is a chemical sciences roundtable. We're asking whether it's the end of small molecule actives. Uh, do you have any comments? It, that is an issue, as I pointed out. And, uh, uh, Theoretically, some of these compounds might be reduced to smaller molecules that still hit the same target site. These large molecules uh, prove the target site is a viable target site. Uh, there may be other compounds that are related that could be economical. That's the hope, at least. Uh, okay. Of course, they're not all small. Glufosinate or phosphenothriacin is a relatively small molecule. That's very a very effective herbicide. Uh, we there are some very highly phytotoxic compounds that are not so complicated that I didn't go over. So uh, uh, there's no rule of thumb, but yeah, the, the molecular tar size is, is an issue. Uh, if you're using a bio a bio pesticide like a uh, microbial bio herbicide that's producing its own compounds. Uh, Molecular size is not an issue, or complexity is not an issue, because you're not synthesizing it in a factory. The the microbes producing it. Okay, well, let's go around the, the table here. Uh, Matilda, you have any final comments? Within uh, my comment again, as I mentioned, um, uh, the herbicide resistance is an issue. Our weed management would be challenging, but uh, we have to emphasize on integrated weed management. That, that's the thing um, I, I have, like a take home message from this talk. Yes. And industry will go on uh, to look for new chemistries. Uh, there's a clear need for innovation and it drives industry, but as said, we need to keep our new weapons sharp. Okay, and Steve. There are a lot of new technologies, many that Jens mentioned in his presentation, and there are even some others that uh, if, if half of these pan out, I think we will have new products in the future that, that we don't have resistance to yet, but nature will find a way if we use something over and over. There's no doubt about that. Okay, well, I certainly wanna thank our three speakers, uh, Mathilde, Jens, and Steve, uh, and thank you all for attending. Uh, the three presentations and the recording of the webinar will be posted on the Chemical Sciences Roundtable uh, website next week. The URL is on the screen as you, as you see now. If anyone has additional questions or comment, comments or concerns, please email csr at nas.edu, which is also on the screen. Uh, once the webinar closes, attendees will automatically be directed to a survey to provide feedback on the webinar. Please do that. Upcoming CSR events include two fully virtual events, two webinars, one on biopolymers occurring on July 19th. The other is on hydrogen occurring on October 7th. Uh, exciting to me because we'll be face-to-face -face a bit, uh, one and a half day uh, in-person workshop, which will also be aired virtually on innovations and catalysis to address modern challenges will take place in Washington, DC on October 24th and 25th. For more information uh, about these events and, and more, you can subscribe for updates on the CSR website. I'd like to thank you all for attending and for all the great questions. And with that, I think we will close.